And what we've used to assist us in that process is creating a map, a guideline, a process that we could follow, a road map that if we engage and embody and, and become active practitioners of what we are asking and calling upon you to do, we can have a great transformation in our lives in healing anything in our lives that is preventing us from being our best. So this month, what we have done and been doing since the beginning of the year is we have combined the 12 steps of AA along with the 12 spiritual principles um, of new thought or the universe, 12 promises of AA, along with 12 spiritual action steps. And the action step is what we're going to focus on today. So if you've been with us since the beginning of the month, you know that we've looked at and made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Can I see your list? <laughs> the, it's at home. The dog ate it. I'll get to it. The spiritual principle is forgiveness. We looked at forgiving ourselves and others for any offenses or trespasses. And last week, Annie spoke to you about self-seeking will slip away. And this week, we look at the spiritual action step of we will learn to live in reverence of life. Now, it's possible that when we first glance at we will learn to live in reverence of life, we don't see that as an action step that we can actually engage in. And actually, it is one of the most powerful action steps we can cause ourselves to do and create change. And so we're going to look at exactly what does that take, what's the benefits of it, and then we're gonna, I'm going to share with you a series of stories that illustrates very clearly the importance of having reverence for others, having reverence for ourselves, and having reverence for what we do in our career, and for reverence for what others have done on their own spiritual journey. And so the first quote I want to put up there is by one of my favorite theolo theologian, theologians, however it comes out, Albert Schweitzer. Uh, the guy has a many quotes, and this is one they had on reverence. If a person loses their reverence for any part of life, they will lose their reverence for all of life. And so one of the most important things I want to share with you as we introduce this topic of reverence, mind you, it would be an easy subject to cover for the next two or three months. This is a huge topic. We're only going to scratch the surface of it. But what it's saying is reverence isn't something that you can have in one area of your life and then not have it in the rest. It's not for the select few. You can't have reverence for one person and not have reverence for all. Reverence is honoring, valuing all of life, starting with oneself. And so the next quote that I want us to take a look at is, reverence is the way of radical respect it means taking, doing something that is beyond the norm, stretching, doing it in a radical way, radical respect. It recognizes and honors the presence of the sacred in everything, starting with our bodies. And if I pause there for a moment, and if we had to honestly evaluate our life backwards, from right here today, and we look backwards on our life, have there been moments where we have not held our bodies as reverent vessels of creation? Is there any room of improvement, or are we sitting here in total and complete denial? Have we at times put stuff in our body that hasn't always reflected us to our highest and best good? Have we thought of our body in ways that are not of reverence. Animals or other people. Have we ever thought of other people and less than? Animals, plants, rocks, the earth, and the waters. It is even an appropriate attitude to bring to our things, to hold our things in reverence, since they are co-creations of humans and the Creator. Is that pretty good? I know I liked it. I was proud of myself when that one came out. So to understand reverence is to regard something or somebody with deep respect, to value, to honor. Nothing is too trivial or second class for reverence, but it has to be demonstrated with concrete actions. And that's what I want to continue to emphasize for as long as I speak up here, is there's a huge gap between intention and action. Never confuse somebody as being a good person because they have good intentions, but their actions don't line up with it. We want to look at what are our actions. Our actions are what reflect who we are at the core of our being. And so 
We, we look at not abusing our body, to eat right, to exercise, to get enough rest. We don't abuse the earth by being wasteful of its gifts. We protect the environment for our neighbors, our community, and the future generations. Reverence is also a kind of radical amazement, a deep feeling tinged with both mystery and wonder. Approaching the world with reverence, we are likely to experience its sister. Ah, ah. Turn to your neighbor for a moment and look at him and go, ah. Now, what if we did it from a place of reverence instead of a place of giddiness? And when we were holding that person in our eyes, we were beholding them in a way that perhaps if we were sitting across from Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Dr. King, Dr. Or Gandhi, and imagine being in that room with them. How would they behold you? Do we for a moment walk around believing, wow, I can behold someone in the same level of consciousness that all the great spiritual teachers that have walked before me can because they've paved the way to make it easier for me. To behold someone in such deep reverence that it shifts, that they feel a sense of, wow, this person sees me in awe. Because we know what it's like to see others as less than. We know what it feels like to be seen as less than, not empowering, not exciting. Its opposite is irreverence. The opposite of reverence is pretty simple, irreverence, which is the dissing, the dissing of the creation. Examples aren't hard to come by. Abuse of self, abuse of others, pollution, wasteful consumption, Cruelty to animals, exploitation of forests, overuse of the land, and on a personal level, irreverence may manifest in a fun word called inui, which is a kind of world weariness. It means we're just kind of worn out. Or it may take the form of a defiant disregard for the feelings of others and a reckless devil-may-care use of resources. So the third quote I want to put up here is there is one unmistakable message in the spiritual practice of reverence because everything is touched by the sacred everything everything has worth this practice then builds self-esteem so you see it's when we practice the principle of reverence it boosts and enhance how we sense and feel not only about ourselves but of others and here's why I'm going to give you first what sounds like a contradictory, but I want to explain to you continuously from all the neuroscience that's coming out in the last 10 years. It's just fascinating because it's proving the value of doing this work. And here's what it says. As we understand, our brain is the only organ in our body that self-regulates to those around us, to the atmosphere, to the environment that we're in. And here's what self-regulation and the purpose of it is. Because our brain is the only organ in our body that self-regulates, it has the ability, for example, to respond to stress. Now, I could put in there responding to reverence, but I want to give you an example of how it works in responding to stress. The brain is continually sensing and responding to the needs of the body. Specialized, now get this, specialized thermostats. Think of it that way. Monitor, inside of your brain, monitor our internal and external worlds. For instance, in our internal world, levels of oxygen and sugar in the blood. These thermostats are monitoring that. When they sense something is wrong, that means the body is stressed. So in your average day, how many times does your body sense something that is wrong? Now what has happened is many times because we, come, we become detached to the feelings of our body and to the impulses that our body are sending our brain is we numb those out and we don't acknowledge them. But how many times during the day is, is our body um, being sensed that something is wrong? And what happens when that, when that takes place is it activates the brain's alarm system. Now when your alarm system gets gets um, um, sensed or, or set, then stress response systems then act to help the body get what it needs. Much of this regulation takes place automatically beyond our own awareness of it. But as we mature, 
our brain requires that we actively participate in our own regulation. When the internal world needs food or water, or the external world is overwhelming or threatening, our body will tell us. Now, if we're connected to our body, which is the purpose of doing yoga, is one of the greatest ways to connect the mind to the body. We become aware of it and we go, okay, ooh, I'm feeling a little stressed there, I'm feeling some tension, I'm feeling some anxiety, I gotta make a shift, I gotta adjust, I gotta do something a little different. But, and, and, and then it says, if we thirst, we seek water. When afraid, we prepare to fight or flee. In short, we self-regulate. We act in response to the sensations and feelings that arise from our brain's alarm system. Now, what I wanted to share that with you is, what happens if the brain was continuously sensing and responding to our thought consciousness, to the energy of our thought consciousness around reverence? And the thermostats that set off the monitors inside of our internal beingness, inside of our internal brain, goes, wow, this person is resonating. It wants to see, sense, reverence. And then it senses and it begins to, to pul pulsate in the body awakening our cells, awakening our organs, and it's going, wow, this feels pretty good to hold this person in reverence. It feels pretty good to hold myself in reverence. And because it's just the opposite of holding ourselves in stress. And why we're always looking to improve our ability to handle stress is, remember, it's the biggest killer of our health. It, more people die of stress-related illnesses than any other illness and any other cause on earth. So we're always looking, what does it take for us to heal that? That's why we do here in, in the service every week, meditation, chanting, all, and, and yoga, all proven scientific methods to reducing our levels of stress in our body. So we, as we learn to improve our ability to hold reverence for self and others, it enhances our self-esteem. So we want to look at then when it comes to, as we shift gears here a little, as we look at our jobs that we do, how many of us can look at our job, and, and it may be a fairly important job, but we make it seem less than, and we don't hold what we do with our life's energy when it comes to producing money in our life in reverence. Here's an example. This is an old parable about making bricks or building cathedrals. Three men were working hard, cutting stone from large blocks of granite. When asked what they were doing, the first fellow said, I'm making bricks. The second said, I'm creating a foundation for a large building. The third person answered, I'm building a cathedral. They are doing the exact same job, and all three responses were accurate, but they re reveal the huge difference in attitudes. It's the difference between tolerating or enjoying one's life, between thinking small or large, between irreverence and reverence. Just like the stonecutters, most of us have a habitual or characteristic mental attitude that determines how we experience and interpret situations. It's pretty clear that the fellow who saw himself playing an important role in building a grand cathedral is much more likely to feel good about his work and his life than the guy who defines his job as just making bricks. So how many times in your life have you minimized what you do for a living? Just by describing the tasks that you perform. Think big. There is no job that can't be meaningful and gratifying. If not because of how it fits into a larger picture of producing human happiness, then at least in terms of the gratification you can feel simply from a job well done. Now, if I applied this principle to myself about the three brick masons, I mostly describe myself when asked, especially while I was in Oklahoma, what I do and what my friends know about me, is that I say I'm a minister of a small but growing church in Victoria. But what if I described myself like a person that was here a couple weeks ago described me? And that was Reverend Kerry Hunter, who's been a, a minister for a while in New Thought, has heard many, many, many New Thought speakers around the, the North America. And this is what she said after her second time visit. She's the one that's contributed to us all of our New Thought material. This is what she said after the second time she was here two weeks ago. It says, I so enjoyed this morning. I think you were up there with the best New Thought speakers on the planet. 
It's refreshing to listen to a well-thought-out sermon that is rich in content. I am so tired of New Thought churches that limit their speakers to 20 minutes with the idea that after that, there's nothing left to say. It's wonderful to get a full, big picture and to have lots to think about. Wow. That's a minister. That's a minister that's heard hundreds of other ministers speak. Wow, what a difference. What a difference. How many of us put down and make less than of what we really do in life? If you ask my wife, Crystal, what she does for a living, she'll say, oh, I work in, in outpatient um, um, <laughs> disease um, uh, uh, treatment. But what she is, is she's really saving lives every day that they come in. Without the, without the medicine, infectious disease, outpatient, they wouldn't be healed. They would die without this medicine. But does she come home and say, I saved 10 lives today? How many of us have done something really significant and are doing it, but we make it less than, we don't hold it in reverence for what we're giving our life energy to? If we are giving our life energy to something that we don't hold in reverence, then maybe we need to make a shift with that. Because it's when we do something that we see with reverence and hold in reverence, boy, does it lift us up. So another area that we often don't hold in reverence is the generations that are coming behind us. We not often view, or it's been a, a consistent theme in society, to view the young people that are coming off after us with less than reverence. And this is going to strike you, I think, when I share these two quotes. I'm going to share them both, and then I'm going to tell you after both quotes where they came from and who said them. One quote, I see no hope for the future for people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was a boy, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders. But the present youth are exceedingly wild and impatient. Does that sound familiar in any way? Any of you remember being described something like that? Second quote, youth today love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, no respect for older people, and talk nonsense when they should be working. Young people do not stand up any longer when adults enter a room. They contradict their parents, talk too much in company, guzzle their food, lay their legs on the table, and tyrannize their elders. Sound familiar? The first one that I read about no hope for the future was by the Greek poet Hesiod, who was active somewhere between 750 and 650 BC. The second one you'll be more familiar with the youth today love luxury was by Socrates, <laughs> who lived somewhere, who spoke those words somewhere between 469 BC and 399 BC. Have we carried that theme of irreverence a little long? Would you have thought those were 2,700 year old quotes? Sometimes others don't have reverence for the amount of spiritual work that another one does in their life. You see, when we meet somebody and we only know them for a short period of time, we judge them on that little bit that we know. And this is the one thing that I have begun learning more than I would say I knew about five years, three years ago even. Is that somebody can come along and they only see a little part of your life and they think they know everything about it. And, and they place their understanding on that little bit of life. And here is, I think, as good of a story as I could have found. I just love it when the universe brings me these stories. It says, the true sound of truth. An old story speaks about a similar problem. A devoted meditator, after years concentrating on a particular mantra, had attained enough insight to begin, begin teaching. The student's humil humility was far from perfect, but the teachers at the monastery were not worried about him. A few years of successful teaching left the meditator with no thoughts about learning from anyone else. He knew it all. But upon hearing about a famous hermit living nearby, the opportunity was too exciting to be passed up. The hermit lived alone on an island in the middle of a lake. So the meditator hired a man with a boat to row across to the island. 
The meditator was very respectful of the old hermit. As they shared some tea made with herbs, the meditator asked about his spiritual practice. The old man said he had no spiritual practice except for a mantra which he repeated all the time to himself. The meditator was pleased. The hermit was using the same mantra he used himself. But when the hermit spoke the mantra aloud, the meditator was horrified. What's wrong, asked the hermit. I don't know what to say. I'm afraid you've wasted your whole life. You are pronouncing the mantra incorrectly. <laughs> oh dear, said the hermit. That is terrible. How should I say it? The meditator gave the correct pronunciation, and the old hermit was very grateful, asking to be left alone so he could get started right away. On the way back across the lake, the meditator now confirmed himself as an accomplished teacher and was pondering the sad fate of the hermit. It's so fortunate that I came along. At least he will have a little time to practice correctly before he dies. Just then, the meditator noticed that the boatman rowing the boat was looking quite shocked. And he turned to see the hermit standing respectfully on the water next to him. <laughs> Excuse me, please. I hate to bother you, but I've forgotten the correct pronunciation again. Would you please repeat it to me? With that, stammering, the meditator said, you obviously don't need it. But the old man persisted in his polite request until the meditator relented and told him again the way he thought the mantra should be pronounced. The old hermit was saying the mantra very carefully, slowly and sl over and over, as he walked across the surface of the water back to the island. <laughs> How many of us have done that to another? Based on our limited perception of someone, we think we know what they need to know. That is not holding another in reverence. But what did the old hermit do? He held him in, hey, tell me how to say this. As he's standing next to him on the water. I need your help, because I haven't quite got this water thing down. And as I said, sometimes we don't always hold in reverence for what others do for, with their job, for their job or their career, because we think, well, that's not what I'm interested in, so that mustn't be what I'd want to do, or why would you waste your time, or, or that's not that beneficial, or that's not that important, or that's not life-changing. So I want to share with you one that's called the Irish Diesel Fitter. Patty and Mick were both laid off, so they went to the unemployment office. When asked his occupation, Patty answered, Knicker Stitcher. I sewed the elastic onto ladies' knickers and thongs. The clerk looked up knicker stitcher on, her, on his computer and finding it classified as unskilled labor, he gave him $80 a week for unemployment. Mick was next in line and asked, when asked his occupation, he replied diesel fitter. Since a diesel fitter was a skilled job, the clerk gave Mick $160 a week. When Patty found out he was furious, he stormed back into the office to find out why his friend and coworker was collecting double his pay. The clerk explained, knicker stitchers are unskilled labor and diesel fitters are skilled labor. What skill, yelled Patty. I sewed the elastic onto knickers and thongs, then Mick puts them over his head and says, yep, diesel fitter. Diesel fitter. Oh, is that Pearl or is that Pearl Ruth or, or Colleen that sent me that one? Which one? That was Ruth. Give Ruth a hand for that. I have three ladies that send me lots of information. There's many of you who send me stuff, but it's, it's Ruth, Colleen, and Pearl send me as much as any. And um, sometimes I remember to give them acknowledgement, but I have a whole um, file saved up all these humor things. I love those. That's the great thing about the internet. How many of you thought you knew how that story was going to turn out? 
And then how many at the end you made a quick shift? Oh, yeah, now I see it differently. That quick shift to seeing something differently is called a paradigm shift. And when we make a paradigm shift from seeing somebody as an irreverent human being to a reverent human being, we make a huge shift, and that's called a paradigm shift. And yeah. How many times do we look at somebody and we don't really know what's going on with them? If we held them in reverence, we might see them differently. We might respond differently. How many of us are sitting in there? We put on something, everything's great, but inside we're really fighting something. We're struggling. We're worried. We're concerned. We're stressed. But we put on that outside self, a face and front that we've become so accustomed to. And that's what we get caught up in seeing in each other. Not what's really going on, not what's really back in there, not what's really important. We make up scenarios that we as human beings, the only animal on earth that can do it, where we can think and guess and try to assume we know what somebody else is thinking without really knowing. Powerful, isn't it? Powerful. And so what's an example if we come from a place of reverence? That regardless of how someone may appear, regardless of how somebody may be dressed, no matter how, regardless of how someone may look, we treat them with reverence. Regardless of the job that we're performing, we hold each human being with reverence, an example of that. The old man shuffled slowly into the restaurant with head tilted and shoulders bent forward. He leaned on his trusty cane with each unhurried step. His tattered cloth jacket, patched trousers, worn out shoes, and warm personality made him stand out from the usual Saturday morning breakfast crowd. Unforgettable were his pale blue eyes that sparkled like diamonds, large, rosy cheeks, and then thin lips held in a tight, steady smile. He stopped and turned with his whole body and winked as a little girl seated by the door, seated by the door. She flashed a big grin right back at him. A young waitress named Mary watched him shuffle toward a table by the window. Mary ran over to him and said, Here, sir, let me give you a hand with that chair. Without saying a word, he smiled and nodded a thank you. She pulled the chair away from the table, steadying him with one arm. She helped him move in front of the chair and get comfortably seated. Then she scooted the table up close to him and leaned his cane against the table where he could reach it. In a soft, clear voice, he said, Thank you, miss, and bless you for your kind gestures. You're welcome, sir, she replied. And my name is Mary. I'll be back in a moment, and if you need anything at all, in the meantime, you just wave at me, and I'll be right over. After he finished a hearty meal of pancakes, bacon, and hot lemon tea, Mary brought him the change from his bell. He left it lay on the table. She helped him up from his chair and out from behind the table. She handed him his cane and walked with him to the front door. Holding the door open for him, she said, Come back and see us, sir. He turned with his whole body, winked and smiled, and then nodded a thank you. You are very kind, he said softly to Mary. When Mary went to clean his table, she almost fainted. Under his plate was found a business card and a note scribbled on a napkin. Under the napkin was a $100 bill. The note on the napkin read, Dear Mary, I respect you very much, and I can see you respect yourself too. It shows by the way you treat others. You have found the secret of happiness. Your kind gestures will shine through to all those who meet you. The man she had waited on was the owner of the restaurant where she worked. This was the first time that she or any of his employees had ever seen him in person. How easy would it have been to get caught up in his appearance? to have treated him like he was homeless or less than or didn't have enough money when in all, at the end of the story, he was the owner of the restaurant. How many of us have misjudged someone based on an appearance and treated them as less than or wanted to distance ourselves because they didn't act or behave or look or present themselves the way that we did? That is treating others with less than reverence. So to personalize this and bring it all home for a moment, I'm always looking at our center. The center is a huge portion of my life. After my own personal relationship with God, self, and family, this is the most, next most important thing to me. To me. And so if I was to ask you, do we treat our center here with reverence? Do we hold our center in reverence? Now, it's not our intention to do that, but what are our actions toward it? Do they reflect the reverence that we have here for the Center for Inspired Living? I want to read to you um, an article 
that Reverend David Owen Ritz, who I met the first time about 20 years ago in Sarasota, Florida, that he wrote and shared with his church a few weeks ago. David Owen Ritz, if you've never heard of him, is one of the most successful New Thought church, um, ministers in um, our North America. His church has over 500 on a Sunday. And this is what he shared a few weeks ago with his congregation. He says, on a Sunday morning, everything you, your center has to offer is given away for free to everyone who attends. You can go to no other place and receive so much and not be charged for it. Even those who give nothing in return can leave with new information, personal insight, positive feelings, and inspiration. Having heard a meaningful message and enjoyed wonderful music, those who give in return will leave with something more, however. They will also leave with the gift of growth and transformation. Because they did not merely witness the service they attended, they invested themselves in it. Every time the basket goes around at the Sunday service, or we send in our monthly pledges, we have an opportunity to decide what our spiritual growth is worth to us. Our giving is a statement of the priority we place on our growth. Many people spend far more every week on entertainment, dining out, and other diversions than they spend on their spiritual growth. Where we put our money reveals our priorities, and we will never reach great spiritual understanding until such an understanding is our clear priority. If we receive something of value, then we owe something of value. We cannot cheat or bargain with spiritual law. If we desire to grow, then we must be willing to invest in our own growth. The greatest reward belongs to those who are willing to stretch a bit in their giving. The law of circulation always compensates us according to our own measure. Spiritual growth is a function of our willingness to make a commitment. Tithing is a tool used successfully by many to learn the power of commitment. A tithe is not viewed as a gift, but rather as a portion of our income left with God in acknowledgement of the good we have already received and shall continue to receive in the future. A tithe literally means a tenth, but most people start with a smaller percentage, one that they are comfortable with, and work their way up as they enjoy results. Tithing is not for everybody. It is intended for those with a desire to learn to live with reverence. For them, tithing is always a life-changing experience. Whew. To hold in reverence. Those are strong words that he shared with his congregation. So do we hold our center in reverence? Do we set aside a portion of our goodness and leave it for God? Or are we afraid? Do we live in reverence? Or do we live in irreverence? The choice is always yours. The final quote of the day, my final words. Oh, that's close. That's how we learn to live in reverence. There we are. To make our religious life deep and strong... We need to recover the lost sense of awe. We need to be taught afresh the love for the universe. And to recover that lost sense of awe, to create a feeling of reverence, we need a fresh vision of God as the source of all creation. So where can you start today with reverence? When you walk down Dallas Road. When you wake up in the morning, you greet that sun. When you go to bed at night, you greet those stars and that moon with great reverence. When you look across at the Olympic Mountains, you view them with awe. When you feel the delicateness of, of the, and the, the coolness of the ocean on your toes. When you sit and view that sunset falling along our beautiful coast. When you are up, on, up high and viewing our, our, our city at night, seeing the beauty that beholds it. Do we see it with rare awe or reverence? That's where we start. And you start as easily as ever with those nearest you. Do you hold those nearest you, including yourself, in reverence and in awe? Let us pray.